So, yep, that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> You've seen this slide before, you'll see it again. It's basically the U.S. array status as of April. Um, the U.S. array was designed originally as this transportable array, which should have a 70 kilometer spacing and a flexible array. What I'm going to talk most, most about is what the flexible array did and what it was designed to do and basically different ideas for how it was used. So you can see here the flexible array is used in a series of projects that I've labeled um, by their acronyms on bold letters. The transportable array as part of Earthscope was really an exploratory part. It was to say, if we put things on a 70 kilometer spacing, what do you get? And the idea was other parts of Earthscope have also operated in this very sort of exploratory mode. The concept of a geoswap was to say, maybe can we use the flexible array and then also, rather than sort of hypothesis-driven science that we've all have to do with our normal grants, could we have done it in a different way? So how was that created? So it really had the goal of saying, okay, we can have flexible array proposals that we can do some, some, somehow more than a series of unconnected footprints. We can make them integrated, we could make them national. It was created because there was a whole series of workshops in different regions in the country that people remember from the early 2000s, if you remember those, um, from different areas, what was interesting in particular places. And then there was a final national workshop to say, if we were gonna try and do something synthetic, where would we do it? Where do we get the maximum bang for the buck? Where could we possibly sort of do things in order that we could integrate them. Now, for, for those people who weren't around at this time, there were several proposals that were submitted towards this, but ultimately, this use of the flexible array was not the one that was adopted by the community. Um, in basically, when the, we got the reviews from those proposals, the idea was that the connections, the necessary connections between those were not a compelling vision for how to go about doing science, and that the community preferred to use the flexible array as much more targeted, much more sort of hypothesis-driven science. So in a way, it's different from the other parts of Earthscope, and that's fine. I mean, it was just, it's a choice of community, that's fine. Um, this was the ultimate concept of it, was to say, well, in the Cascadia, you have subduction zone as you go into Mesozoic Batholith, as you go across the Snake River Plain in the Yellowstone Hotspot, as you go into basement um, core block uplifts like the Black Hills. There's something very interesting going on with the Mid-Continent Rift and Lake Superior region. And then uh, it would be great to have a transect that goes from the Ozarks somewhere around there through the, Appala through the Southern Appalachians as you go from Grenville um, to Appalachian origin into the trains of the Appalachian orogeny. Okay, so that was the idea. Oh, and the idea of xenoliths and using xenoliths to kind of get crustal information if you either wanted to know about the crust or the uppermost mantle, or if you saw that as just like the noise getting in the way of the deep mantle signature. Either way, we thought that was probably a useful activity. Um, so the idea was, the reason that we did that is because it addressed fundamental aspects of the growth and modification of the North American continent. And we could use North American examples to understand the general processes of continental evolution everywhere. And finally, because then, Rather than working on specific areas and specific things, you can look at a continental scale transition. In other words, you can get the total to be more than the sum of the parts. So, and that's what came out of it. And again, we, we didn't, that approach was not adopted. In fact, rather, we did something that looks not unlike this. So let me tell you what these are. If you, there's a black line, those are broadband arrays that are densified. If they're red lines, they're active seismic studies. Um, here, here in the salt and trough. Some, sometimes in salt and trough, there's both an active and a uh, passive line, passive broadband line. If there's boxes, that means that there are arrays, like the OINC array of seismic stations. And in some cases, they're far more sort of geophysically oriented, the ones on the west coast. Um, so less sort of integrated geological, geology plus geophysics, but still um, nice broadband arrays that they give um, higher resolution because they're at a closer spacing. Okay, now to me, I looked at this map and I was like, eh, not so different. Or I like to quote Randy Keller, who was quoting Mark Twain at the time, who said, the reports of geoswap death have been greatly exaggerated. We effectively did it. I mean, the, the idea of taking something, basically going across the northern part and then going in the Lake Superior region and then doing something that goes from the Ozarks to the Appalachians 
was essentially done. There were other things, the salt and trough was sort of the idea of the salt and trough to Walker Lane. Um, Xenolith studies have been done as well. So the idea, I mean, it was kind of the obvious place to do a lot of these targets. So it made sense. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them because they're happening here on the East Coast, close to where we are. And what I like about them is they're integrated projects, but they integrate different things. So for instance, MAGIC, which was recently um, funded, focuses more on sort of, as I understand it, um, um, surface uplift geodynamics um, associated with the Appalachians. SESME focuses, as I understand it, more on sort of the deeper processes going below the Sewanee suture and other things associated with the margin there. Very cool projects. Um, sugar, another active seismic proposal um, with potentially the most, um, the acronym that they really had to work for on this one. Um, it has two seismic lines which will complement the broadband line. So it's, there's been some really nice synergies that have gone on in the East Coast that have been sort of unplanned. I mean, they just happened as people propose things. Um, Kevin Mahan will talk more about this later today, but the idea of xenoliths and using xenoliths from different crustal provinces to figure out what's below those crustal provinces so you can make reasonable sort of crustal models based on um, good data. Okay, so the, the point being, all the elements that were in the geoswath were sort of happening. So we've done, in fact, an accidental geoswath, I would say. I wanted to point out um, one thing, though, about the IDOR proposal, just because I've been involved in it, of what these integrated projects have brought to EarthScope. I mean, what, what are the things that they were doing that we weren't getting other ways within the EarthScope? And I'm going to do that with IDOR, um, sort of on the acronym, sort of, critique. This is like the lamest acronym, the most uncreative one, I should say. I really should have taken up John Hole's E-I-E-I-O, which was Earscope Investigations, Idaho, Oregon, something or other, but whatever. Um, so active seismic line going across um, the bound, the old boundary between North America and the accretive terrains in Oregon, looking at the Idaho Bathlet, which we knew very little about, actually, in detail. Um, a huge number of people involved in this. We estimate that we have over 100 students involved in one aspect or the other of this project. There's a huge broader impact associated with these large size proposals. Almost accidentally, we did things in exactly the right order. Rich Gashney, who was working in the area, has done a fantastic job of taking what looked like, before his work, a blob of granite that was the Idaho Baffleth and translating it into something that has some patterns and has some meaning to it. So we now know there is an Idaho batholith. It actually has very little mantle signature. It may be a subduction through a very thick wedge of sediments, or it may just not be a subduction-related batholith. We also think it's now much younger than we thought it was before, at least the mass of it. And it makes sense because, of course, petrology and geochemistry are the record of the interaction between the physical processes and the tectonic processes. So his really nice work in this area gives us the framework, then, to do a lot of the other work that's going to go on. And what's interesting is when we started doing this work, we wrote this nice proposal, we have all these hypotheses. It turns out almost all our hypotheses are wrong in detail. That's not bad, that's good. If you come in and you think you understand what the idea is and you understand how the system works and you just prove that's how it works, you don't really get anywhere. The fact that we've had to basically throw out a lot of the ideas as the new information has come in about what exactly the orientation of this, um, the major boundary between these is over time and how the kinematics change, or whether the thing was actually in place or not at the time, which is another poster that's at this meeting, those are interesting results that we would not have done, and they're giving things that are really quite surprising. The active seismic study was done last summer. Kathy Davenport will talk about that, and we have just the preliminary data on that. Um, and then Paul Bremer will per, um, show us some of the ambient noise with broadband. And again, very interesting results. We didn't quite expect them, even though they've only been in the ground now for a year, and we'll get them out. The, again, the point being that it was this integration that, these, that different groups who don't often work together are working really closely, and we can by doing all of that, and starting with Rich's work on the um, geochemistry and petrology, we can really put uh, the Idaho Baffleth now into sort of the context of the rest of the Cordillera, which we really couldn't do before. It was sort of transitional. It wasn't Canada, it wasn't California, it looked something like that. 
and it has a very different record than anywhere else. And all of those things were things we didn't think about and were kind of cool. So the question is, if the integrated projects work so well, and it's been a lot of fun doing the projects, what is it that we've lost? What did we lose by not doing something more synthetic? And I think that's worth talking about too. Although we know very well where those, the projects were and what's going on there, they, they, they had to, because they were hypothesis-driven, study a specific area or a specific problem. But they don't get, if the goal is the evolution of the North American craton, you're getting little bits and pieces, you're not getting a synthetic whole. So you don't see the connections very well. It's possible that we can do a little backfill here. So um, we propose that there's a possible and maybe probable workshop going to be at the next Geological Society of America meeting, which is going to be in Denver. And the idea would be to get one person from each of the funded Earthscope um, projects that have some sort of integrated aspect, some sort of geological integrated aspect, and have them all come together and meet and talk about how we can basically build how we can combine what's already been done to make the total greater than some of the parts. So in other words, we might be able to sort of backfill what, what was going on. Um, the Canadians, this book just came out from Lithoprobe, and they've done, so 10 years later, they're still doing interesting sort of syntheses as a result of the Lithoprobe project that went on. And I think that's a really good model for how we might be able to go forward with this. The other thing that people will remember, potentially, is the Kansas problem. We missed certain areas. You will notice that there is a broad swath in the middle of the country called the Great Plains that we have missed. The reason is quite simple. You can't hypothesis test. We don't know what's there. The only way to accept that and to, to deal with it is to say, maybe we should do some exploratory work. Maybe it's not too late in the few key areas to say, can we make this a little bit more national? So, one possibility is to say, you might want to put a few connector corridors in there. Maybe not all of them, maybe just some of them. But I can guarantee you, in any of those areas, there's really interesting geological and geophysical information to be gathered. They, they have just as interesting questions as any of the ones that have been funded today. It's just a matter of, you might not be able to say it as a testable hypothesis of what exactly you would do. All right. So, exploratory work is an option. Alternatively, you might want to sort of concentrate on something. You might want to take a different approach with um, Earthscope or, or Earthscope as it moves forward in, in basically a little bit more precision. So, I like this diagram only because it's Earthscope data used by international authors where they're doing tomographic models and those big arrows here are just to point out what geologists really can contribute or help with is just little tiny, like one pixel or two at the top of that screen. Um, but yet that's all the history, it's all the record of timing that's preserved in that area. So we know when, as geologists, that basically it's the upper five kilometers is where society and the geological society sciences really connect. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about resources, like fracking is something that's coming on. It doesn't matter whether it's mining, as you go on, it doesn't matter whether it's groundwater, something that's hugely important, or rafting. Um, in a slide I pulled from Chuck Bailey where you can put in, take out, and you're going across a fault zone with the big rapids. So the point is that the upper five kilometers from geologist's point of view would be a really great place to sort of concentrate things as we go forward in, in a different way, basically, because if you ask geologists what they want from Earthscope, it's basically resolution, resolution, resolution. It's basically to be able to integrate across from what, the ge what we get geophysically and what we've seen lower in the lithosphere and into the asthenosphere to what basically we're living on now, the crust. So you might want to sort of, um, how shall I say, give this a little bit more precision as well. What the geologists are really asking for is resolution, but appropriate resolution. So basically resolution appropriate to the problem that you're um, trying to solve and the ability to integrate between the geophysics, the geochemistry, the petrology. Or really, you might be able to, if by taking a sort of a five kilometer, sort of 10 kilometer view, expand to different communities. You might get away from tectonics and move more towards um, groundwater things or fracking things or other societal problems where you could in take a whole new group of people and bring them into this room as well, interested in other problems. And that would be kind of cool. So sort of follow up, you might have Earthscope interested in more sort of crustal scale things, 
maybe it's targeted scientific drilling to reinforce that, or um, sort of a continental style program focused on these socially relevant problems. Um, so in summary, since Matt's standing right here, planned or not a geoswath happened, there might be an advantage to trying to figure out how to make it into a synthetic hole. I'm biased, but exciting and integrative science I think is being done in these areas, but we might be able to make up for that. What, what we've lost is a lack of connection and we've gone over areas with poor understanding and that's okay, those are opportunities, that's not a bad thing. Um, and then finally, um, I think you could, if, if that's of interest, more geologists can be drawn in as we concentrate with higher resolution studies. So perhaps it's time to bring back the bumper sticker that we proposed long ago. Thank you.